Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all here to this session of Ahina Cultus. Now we're after dancing a set, and we're going to continue with a session of music. The musicians will play a selection of jigs. They will include the ship in full sail, the battering ram, a trip to the cottage, and Jerry Beaver's hat. Coming towards the end, we will have a step dancer, Geraldine Conroy, doing her piece. Away with you.
Thank you, Geraldine. Now I think it is time we had a song, and tonight we have a very talented lady here, no one other than Peggy Lynch. Peggy has won uh, All Ireland Honours in last year, and tonight I think she's going to sing for us The Banks of the Salon. It being early on a bright harvest morning, I strayed by the banks of Ceylon to gaze on such beauties of nature that graced every woodland and lawn. Oh, the prospect was surely enchanting as gay lassies in juvenile gloom promenaded by the banks of that river that flows by the town of Macroom. <clears throat> I, being airy and fond of recreation, to this river I venture to roam. But being weary from my ramblings and roving, I sat myself down by a grove. I sat there some time meditating until the sun or bright rays had withdrawn. And the lady of queenly came down by the banks of Ceylon. I arose with great joy and amazement and accosted the damsel so fair. She appeared me like Venus, adorned with jewels most rare. Were I ruler of France or of Prussia, it's with me you'd soon wear the crown. My darling, you're the beauty of sweet Massy Town. We talked and we walked on together, inhaling the sweet pleasant air. Till at length we came to a mansion. She said, Sir, my father lives there. Oh, his manner to me was appalling. With his dark, angry looks and his frown. Like an arrow, all the way back to sweet Massy Town. And it's now I've retired from my roving with a heart full of sorrow and grief. There is no 
console me or bring me the slightest relief. I will roam through the African desert until death beckons me A good pig. Now I think now I think that we'll change the program again and we'll have a selection of music from our musicians. They will play some reels. The first one being George White, to be followed by the Congress, and then Sheehan's reel. We will have two more dancers here then. Today, um, they are Elaine and Martina Carey. Thank you very much, musicians. That was quite lively. And now I think no night would be complete without having a story from Neely Coakley. Neely is a man that has some very funny stories. Tonight, I don't know what he has lined up for us, but I'm sure it will be something very good. I would like you all to welcome Neely Coakley. Okay. Well, <coughs> there was this carpenter that I knew 
and you know to do your heart good to see him at work because any kind of a faker no matter how complicated it was if you could describe it to him at all he was able to make it well provided now of course that it was in the building line ah well no we say he couldn't make a clock or a mowing machine or a thing like that he was the first man around our part of the country to make a stand barrel churn you are some man that fought up the country then and described it to him but i am told that he improved on the original because he put a glass peephole in the front of it so that you could see the entire operation going on inside <coughs> sure didn't he build a new house for johnny papat you know, johnny had a little shop and he used to sell fishing tackle and you know people said that he was the right man for the job or oh, a fly by well uh, this carpenter anyway he built the house for him and he built it around the old one so that business could go on as usual and when he had the new house finished then he threw the old one out the window oh i tell you that man he was a marvel and people were coming to him from all quarters with every kind of a complicated contraption to have it copied or repaired although he told me himself well he told me this now in a great secret he said that the hardest and the most complicated request he ever got was from a woman and sure to so far gone now, I suppose there's no harm in telling it, sure, I know it won't go any further. He said he wasn't saying the workshop this way every day, and uh, this woman came into him. And she looked around at the walls for fear that of years. And then she said to him, could you make a division, says she, for a double bed? And in what form would it take, says she? I don't know, says she, sure to you, the carpenter. I suppose, then, says she, something like a gate. Wouldn't that be right, Con, says she, putting her head out around the corner of the door, a gate? I don't know, Bridget, says the husband. He was outside. Look, says she, you leave me out of my mind yourself in that bed. No, look, he said, don't be trying to draw me into it. Well, the carpenter thought, then, that maybe it is one of those old-fashioned camp beds that they had. Here, you see, they were there long ago. They were closed in on the three sides and you were roofed in overhead. I don't know too why the people didn't smother inside them. And he thought maybe that she wanted a kind of a gate put in the front of that to lock in the children. Uh, of course, children and all you see usually put the parents that in. Sure, if you look down the room door, you would see all the little heads and they cock out from under the quilt, like uh, chickens from under a hen's wing. She said it was an ordinary wide double bed and she wanted a division put in it a gate. And uh, where in the bed, like he said, in the front of it, is it? No, she said, in the middle. A cross is it to see? No, no, she said, up and down. And it would be very handy, she explained to the carpenter, if she could bring this thing into position before she got to sleep at night. But uh, she wouldn't like it uh, to be permanent. Uh, could that be done? Well, he said it could be done, all right, but uh, to take a bit of ingenuity to do it. She put her head out around the corner of the door and she said to the husband outside, "'Twon't be permanent, Con." Well, the carpenter sat down anyway and as the man said, he put on his thinking cap. And then he got this bit of a living by one deal board and he began drawing lines in it. He showed it to her saying, would that do? She said it looked all right. Well, he made out a list of materials for her and he told her to go into the hardware and to get them and that himself would be out to the house the following Monday, which he was. He made a workbench out of the kitchen table and he set to work. Uh, three by one and a quarter scantling see all that he thought they'd be strong enough. And he bridled joint to the four corners, it was the quickest. And in no time at all here the gate made. Six foot six long and four feet high, with a diagonal stiffening piece. He came then, <coughs> and if you saw the clever way, he put two grooves, one at the top and the other at the bottom of the bed, so that the division could slide up and down, for all the world now you say, like the sluice gate of a canal. But that wasn't the beauty of it. He came then, and he put two pulleys on the rafters overhead, and he ran a piece of sash card from the top and the bottom of the gate over the pulleys, and onto two sash weights on the other side. <coughs> he kept adding pieces of lead onto the weights then until he had achieved a perfect balance. 
Uh, there was one rope then that Bridgie could pull the gate up with it. And then, before she got to sleep at night, there was another rope that she could take and turn me to Con, she could say, Goodbye, all faithful, pulling the rope and bringing the gate down between them. Well, he called them down to see it working. Well, Bridgie was diverted, and Con couldn't get over the mechanics of it. Nothing in the world would persuade him but that it was only on ball bearings because he'll only to put his finger that way to the gate and it would rise up and down as free as a zip fastener. <laughs> Which reminds me of the woman that went into the home and go to buy a trousers for the husband. And uh, the straper anyway, he threw a couple of trousers up in the counter to her and she was looking at them and examining them. And one had buttons closing up the front, you know, and uh, the other one had a zip fastener. So. She said to the draper that she'd take them over the buttons all together because, yes, she said, he had to pull over there before with a zip fastener in it, and you know, she said, he used to be always catching his tie in it. <laughs> well, <coughs> to get back to the carpenter anyway, I can tell you that he was well paid for his trouble, and uh, when he was uh, going home that evening anyway, Con conveyed him to the pieces of board in, and they were talking away about this and that. And then he said to him, I suppose, he said, you were wondering why Bridgie wanted that fake up put in the bed. <laughs> he got a... Uh, the carpenter said he was a bit curious, all right. Well, you know, he said, it's hard to believe it, but it's like this. I tell you, he said, I had a little mare there, he said, and I was breaking her in. And I put the car on her the swerve day, he said, going into the Christmas market with about a geese. <laughs> Amazing cargo. We were going along the road anyway, he said, and whatever way this sheep stuck her head out around the gate pillar. Well, he said, the little mare bolted. She went across the road, he said, in over the fence. Myself, geese from the hall at he said, landed the in the field. And you know, he said, to the will of God, we were never capsized. Well, he said, the little mare did about three rounds of the field before I could bring her to a halt. It was like Ipsum. Anyway, he said, I coaxed her out the gap again, but I can tell you, he said, I got a queer fright of it. Well, he said, I came home that night, and I was telling the woman there about it, he said, and the fright I got. And anyway, he said, uh, we went to bed that night, and... <coughs> Well, he said, Bridgie was sleeping between me and the wall. And we were talking away for a while, he said, and then uh, Bridgie fell asleep. So I, I said, I might as well go to sleep myself too, sure. Why did I want to wake from? There was no one to talk to. And out in the night, he said, I began to dream. And of course, he said, this thing being in my mind from the freight I got that morning, didn't I dream? He said that I was going out to the wing for a lot of little with a little mare. And just beyond the turn of the bridge, there's a fierce declivity down into the locker field. What was it, he said, but didn't these two dogs come out over the ditch fighting? Well, he said, the little mare bolted. She went across the road and then over the fence, <coughs> down the declivity, and got capsized <coughs> below. And of course, he said, she could kick herself to death and she got the tackling. Well, he said, the thing to do in an occasion like that was to throw all your weight as hard as you could down on top of her head. Well, he said, this I did, and I cut a hold of her that way, he said, by the ear with one hand, <coughs> and I was trying to calm her down, and I'd, oh, girl, oh, easy now, that's the pet. And at the same time, he said, I was trying to open the tackling with the other hand. <laughs> with that, to see, I woke up. Do you know, he said, it was Bridgie screeching that woke me. And she shouting, stop, stop, sure, what are you at? Will you lay off of me? She said, and let go of my ear, I'm nearly smothered by you. Well, you know, she said, if you don't stop your caffling, I'll have to put a division in that bed. And when the same thing happened in, again a couple of nights after, Bridgie, as the man said, invoked the 1920 Act and introduced partition. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neely. I think that was a very unusual story. And I don't know, will it bring lots of unusual ideas to the, to the part of the country? Well, no, Peg, what do you think of the story? Very good. Brilliant. Nearly one of Nearly's best. What would you think of a division in the bed? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What would you think about it? <laughs> I don't think it's all big. <laughs> well, no, we will give up a bit of fooling and we'll get back down to music and dancing. I know uh, our musicians will give us a selection of hard pipes and they will be joined again by Geraldine Conroy.
Thank you, Geraldine. I know I see there's another lady here anxious to sing a song. That is none other than Teresa Dennehy. How long have you been singing, Teresa? I don't know, really, do A couple of years, I suppose. That is traditional mm -hmm. singing. And do you enjoy it? I do indeed, yeah. And what song have you lined up for um, us tonight? I think I sing Blue Throne Right End. Beautiful. My own native. <coughs> Though so far away you are today from scenes of childhood days across the foam to seek a home in far Los Angeles whenever you close your eyes tonight you'll find your heart is drawn to the home and friends you left behind on the hills around <coughs> Ryland. You can see old bar a-coring and the fair slopes of Turing. The hills of old Kilcullen where the drip sea flows between. Or can you picture not the gold at the sunset or the dawn? Where the purple heather shining on the hills around dry land. You can travel up to Flag Mount to the top of old Sea Fing. Across the box of mushrooms majestic and serene. You'll hear the lark a singing there where grows the canawan where the purple heather shining on the hills around dry land. You can go across to Glownaglock and on to Carrigagour. Down Rock with Oak, the Heron, the dark hills of Knockrower. Or should you stray down Coolinay? When the dew is on the lawn, you can hear the blackbird pipe his notes on the hills around dry land. Though Tipperary's hills are grand, where I have settled now, Till my thoughts go back to that dear old spot as the evening sun goes down. And when I rise each morning and gaze on Schliefnaman, it reminds me the days I spent on the hills around dry land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Now maybe our musicians would oblige us with a few of the selection of reels.
Thank you very much, everybody. It has been a most enjoyable night. I would like to say a special word of thanks to Genjo and you for coming here tonight and recording the show. Also to our host, Paddy O'Donovan and Nancy. Perhaps, Nancy, you might like to say a few words here to us? Ah, come on. Well, I'm sure everybody here extends our thanks to you for the night. And now I suppose we will conclude with a selection of polkas.